Well, good morning, everyone. I know it's a little uh, wet and rainy and cold. That has really changed over the past few days. Uh, but it is good that we have another opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. I'm grateful for every opportunity that I get uh, to be with God's people, wherever they may be, uh, each and every Sunday uh, that we can, and all the points in between. I believe in that, too. Uh, but today, we're going to be in the book of Galatians, chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, I'm going to read the first five verses. Galatians is quickly becoming one of my favorite books. I've been uh, doing a lot of studying in this book uh, recently, uh, and I've really enjoyed the Word of God uh, and the song we just sang, Wonderful Words of Life. Uh, just, just so grateful for this precious Word of God that He has given us. Galatians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1, the Word of God says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Father, again we bow before you today with thankful hearts, God, in humility, God, thanking you for this day that you have given the opportunity to, uh, Lord, be together as your people, to worship you, to praise you, uh, and God, to hear your word. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much that you have granted us this day and, God, that you will be a blessing to us if we heed your word, God, if we listen to you, uh, God, and remain faithful, Lord, in your spirit. And, God, I pray that you would just uh, be with us. Uh, God, just use this word today to help us in our everyday walk with you, that we live and that we work for you in this world. Uh, God, I do pray especially for Brother Rich, God, in his recovery. Just be with him. Uh, God, lift him up. You know what is needed in his body. And God, I pray that you would do those things necessary to get him back to where, uh, Lord, he is your under-shepherd here with this flock, uh, Lord of yours. And God, we pray and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. In December of 1903, many of you may have studied this in school at one point. You remember the Wright brothers, uh, the first people to fly. But in 1903, after many attempts, the Wright brothers were finally successful in getting their, what they called a flying machine, uh, off of the ground um, and started to fly. And of course, naturally, they were thrilled. Uh, I would be too. I'd be scared at the same time, but I would be thrilled. And so they went and rushed and telegraphed their sister, Catherine. And this is what they said. The telegraph said, we have actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. Now, Catherine, she hurried to the editor of the local newspaper, and she showed them the message that she had got from her brothers, and he glanced at it, and he said, well, how nice the boys will be home for Christmas. You see, he had totally missed the big news. He had totally missed the big picture that man had actually flown. And th this salutation that we read today of the book of Galatians that Paul uh, wrote to the churches of the region of Galatia, in much the same way he did in uh, Romans and in Titus. Uh, it's a very dense passage of Scripture if you want to break it down. It's a very dense passage, but it's, I believe it's also richly significant in what it's trying to tell us. And as we see in the greeting to the churches, Paul was God's man uh, proclaiming God's message of God's miracle. And often in Paul's day, as well as our own time and times in between, I believe the message at that time sometimes would get muddied, it got marred, it got confused, it got altered. Uh, and so Paul had to set things straight at some times. Uh, and, and it happens just like that today, a combination of these and, and other things. And when this happens, when that muddying happens, when that marring happens, that confusion happens, we tend to lose sight of the big picture 
the big true picture, as it said sometimes, we can't see the forest for the trees. But these five verses, even though they're dense, I believe they're a concise summary of the entire Bible narrative. Now what I mean by that when I say Bible, the entire Bible narrative, is, is basically what is this whole Word of God about? What is it all trying to say? What is it all trying to, to, to proclaim to us? And what I'd like to do is answer three questions about this big picture that I believe will help you in your Christian walk as a follower of Jesus Christ and to be big picture Christians. Now, the first question we must answer is, what is the big picture? Now, have you all ever heard the expression, a bird's eye view? I know you've probably heard that in, in time. You've probably uh, seen uh, bird's eye view art and things, uh, uh, landscapes or aerial photography. Nowadays, in the modern age, we've got Google Earth and Google Maps that you can see from the satellite images. Uh, but that, that expression, a bird's eye view, it's used to convey uh, the thought of a, uh, the view of a bird that is high, and he has a high and overall perspective of a place that we don't normally have. Um, and we will only see this big picture if we have the high and the overall view of God. Now you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, last time I checked, I wasn't God. How can I have that high and overall view that God has? And of course, we'd be right. We're not God. We are, we are finite. We're like someone behind a tall privacy fence, and we're watching a parade go through, through an old knot hole is all we can see. We're just looking through that knot hole, and we can see some things that are passing by only at the present time that's passing through that knot hole. Now, we have some, maybe some remembrances of things that have went past, but we can't see what's coming up in the future um, because we are finite. We can only see what is in the present at the moment. While God, on the other hand, he can see the parade as a whole, past, present, and future time, all at the same time, simultaneously, he can see every bit of what's going on with his God's eye view. He can see the big picture. Now, the thing is, we have to see the big picture, too. If there was only something that God did, something that God could give where we could see that big picture, where we could see his, birth, his God's eye view, you know what I think he did? I think he gave us these precious 66 books, the word of God that we have, that shows us what is his view, what a gracious God he is to reveal his view to us. We have an ability to look in the past, and the present and the future in this word of God. How gracious is God to do that for us? Praise God. This, this holy Bible is God's eye view. It's past, it's present, and it's future. And we can see that throughout the entirety of this wonderful book of God. Even here in Galatians, in chapter 1 and verse 4, we see past, present, and future is indicated. And in verse 4, we see the big picture. We see exactly what it is. And here's the answer to the first question. What is the big picture? Now, if you don't get anything, I want you to get this today because this is it. This is what holds everything together. The big picture is God's plan through Jesus Christ of putting right his creation from the corruption it did to itself by its sin so that he and we, heaven and earth, may dwell together and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's, that's it. That's the big picture. That's what God is trying to do. That's what God is doing from Genesis all the way to Revelation. He is putting the world right. Do you see how that's why that Jesus told us to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? That's what God wants. He wants to dwell with His creation. He wants to be with us. That is the entire Bible in a nutshell. And I believe that we must remain diligent uh, in keeping that big picture in mind as we study the Word of God, as we, as we get into the Word and we're looking at certain passages and looking at, at the different records that's there. Uh, keep it in mind when you are studying the Bible. Remember it when you're reading the Old Testament record of the saints of God that, that, uh, that, that were in faith. And, and remember it when you're reading the prophecies and the prophets, all the different ones. Remember it when you're reading the poetry of the Word of God in Psalms and the other places. And remember it in the life and ministry 
<coughs> excuse me, of the apostles and Jesus himself. Remember that big picture that's there. Always that God is putting us right. God is doing a work. God has a plan through Christ to do these things. Now I stated earlier that past, present, and future are indicated in verse 4. And I want to focus on the present today, but I want to take a brief look at the past and the future. Uh, we see the past in verse 4 in two places. First at the beginning and the second place at the end of the verse. And, and the first one it says who gave himself for our sins. That's past tense. Gave. That's speaking, of course, of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, without the sacrifice, uh, without the death of Christ, without the resurrection of Christ, the big picture is not possible. The big picture of God putting everything right is all done through Jesus Christ, every bit of it. It cannot happen. God can't put the world right except through Jesus Christ, Him becoming a human, Him uh, taking upon flesh. We just had the, the Christmas season, which we're actually still in, if you think about it, of the incarnation, how God in His mercy came down to meet us and, and be with us and dwell with us. That was part of that big picture. But there's even more past. The second part and last part of the verse, it says, according to the will of God. It says, He gave Himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Now that indicates an even further past. Jesus gave himself, that's past, but it was according to the will of God that was passed way back. Now how do we know this? In Genesis 3.15, we find this will of God pertaining to Jesus Christ. Genesis 3.15, this verse is known as the proto evangelium and that's just a big word that means the first good news or the first gospel. Listen to what it says in Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now just to give you a little context of what's going on, Adam and Eve had been in the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect. Everything was good. They partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Sin happened because they disobeyed God. The fall of man happened. You remember uh, the serpent, the devil, here tempting Eve to do this. And, and God puts a curse on them. And this is part of the curse here that happens. But it's not just part of the curse. It's part of the putting right. It's a part of the big picture. He told Eve, he told Adam and Eve, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. What God was saying there is I'm going to make it right. What the devil did in tempting you and you sinned and you gave in, you yielded to that temptation and sinned against me, I'm going to make it right. I'm going to send a man, a seed of a woman, and that's, just, that's Jesus Christ, to fix what has happened. That was his will, and it's still his will today to put right, to save, uh, to p make people born again. You see, it shows from the very beginning that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was God's plan. That was the big picture. His will, and all that we see from Genesis on is that plan being put forth. That plan of God in action. And it was that plan from the ancient past. Isn't it amazing and, and I think even humbling that that far back that the Lord was thinking about me. That the Lord was thinking about you that far back. That he, he understood and know that in, in, in his, his knowledge that he has, he knew there would come a time where, where Michael Lumpkin needed salvation, that Michael Lumpkin needed to be put right again. He was thinking about us so long ago. All that time ago, He wanted you to repent of your sins and trust and believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. That deliverance, that rescue as it's talking about in verse 4. You see, this brings us to the future now. If we've been delivered, that implies we have a future with our deliverer. You see, you can have a deliverance from a past place of sin, and unrighteousness and unholy living apart from God 
to a future with God in righteousness with Him. What a glorious thing that God has done in putting right His creation and, and showing us the big picture. Now, it's stated in the big picture, so that He and we can dwell together. Don't you want to dwell together with God? To be with God uh, continually? And if you want to know more on that future, I'm just going to be brief on this. Just read Revelation 21 and 22. That's all about the dwelling with God. When God comes down and establishes the kingdom on earth forever, and we're going to forever be with the Lord. We'll dwell with Him forever. All about the dwelling together. Now, what happens sometimes is we, get, we tend to get a little too hung up on the future aspect of it, which I know is grand and glorious. I'm waiting for that day. But we tend to get a little too hung up on that without a thought for today without a thought for the present. Now, I want to make very clear that the deliverance it's talking about in this verse is not solely talking about the future, when we're finally and fully delivered. Verse 4 says, Deliver us from this present evil world. Did you catch that? Present. That's what? That's when? When? Today, right now. Now, don't gasp when I say this, but the phrase deliver us from this present evil world is not referring to going to heaven when we die. It's not referring to that. Although that's a reality, that shouldn't be the Christian soul focus. This is where the present comes in. The right now, in this life we have today, your life as a Christian living in the world today. Well, how does this verse describe the present world. One word. Evil. Evil. This present evil world. Evil has been defined as an absence of good, or you could say a deviation from God's perfect will and character. And the reason we would say that is because God is good defined. He is what good is. So the way this present world works, it says in verse 4, deviates from the ways of God. It's an evil world, and that evil deviates from what God has said and what God wants. We are now living in this evil world. I don't think that I have to describe how evil the world is. I think you can turn the television on and see just how evil the world is. You can meet evil at work where you're at, or at school, or at your job, wherever it may be. You're going to see evil wherever you're at. But remember... I said deliverance is not solely future, but now. Well, how is that done? How are we delivered from the present evil world today? You see, when one puts their faith in the Lord and repents of their sins, and you're, you've been given the Spirit of God to live in you, you then become a true image bearer of God at that point through the Spirit of God. And that being an image bearer is our true purpose of our being. That's why we were created. We were created, if you remember in Genesis, when, when God created man, he said created, he, he created them in his own image. We were to be his image in the world. God's intention for humanity was and is to be his image bearers, to show the world the right way, the ways of God. So when we're saved, when we're born again, we are delivered from the evil ways that deviate from God's perfect and good and holy and pure ways, and we can then be examples of the right way. We can then be examples of what it is to be godly. I mean, look at the book of Acts, and you, you can see the, the Word of God uh, in Acts just really shows this in great action. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possession, 
possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now you may be thinking, what's so great about that? Well, if you have read history on the Roman culture of that time and the culture of the day and how society worked, this was not the way the culture worked at that time and in that day. It was a dog-eat-dog world at that time. You didn't have, you didn't have benevolent societies taking care of homelessness. You didn't have all these things that are set up now that we have, that we've grown up with, to help folks. It was, I'm going to care for me and mine, and I don't care about anybody else. But then you have the church in the book of Acts. They're handing food out. They're giving of themselves. They're selling their possessions to help another person out. They are living for God. They are not bound by the way the world was. And, and right now, it's a cruel and evil world <coughs> that we live in. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog culture. But you see, where the world is unjust, the Christian will be just. Think about that. Where the world is polluted, we will be the ones that are pure because of God. Where the world hates, we will love. We are delivered from these great evils. We don't have to participate in these things. That's why it says we, that He might deliver us from this present evil world. We don't have to be like this evil world. We're delivered. And we can live in righteousness with God. We don't have to live in the bondage of evil desires and actions that take place. You know what will happen? When you get saved, you will exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, Verse 22, listen what the fruit of the Spirit is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That is God's image-bearing. That's us bearing the image of God when we love and we have joy and, and we're meek and we're, we're self-controlled. All those things of the fruit of the Spirit should be in display in our lives showing that we are not with the evil world that is presently here. We've been delivered from that. This is exactly what Jesus was conveying through the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, what a wonderful thing, the Sermon on the Mount. I encourage everybody, the Sermon on the Mount, Mount needs to be read over and over and over in the Christian life. It is such an impactful sermon that Jesus, Jesus gave. He would say at the beginning, you've heard it said. What that's conveying is, this is the way the world sees it. This is the, the way of the world. But then he would turn right around and say, I know you've heard that, but I say unto you. And that's saying, you know, this is, I'm going to convey to you this is God's way. This is how I want you to do it. Where the world says one thing, but the Lord says another, he is saying his way is the right way. And that great Sermon on the Mount, it covered all aspects of living. All aspects of living, all of the, the complications of life, all the issues that we can face, all the matters and all the relationships and how to do each one God's way and in His image is contained in that Sermon on the Mount. That's why it's so important for the Christian to study the Word of God and especially study that Sermon on the Mount. I mean, thank God for His deliverance from this present evil world. Aren't you glad that there's a better way to live? than what's portrayed out in the world, than what this cruel world offers? Aren't you glad today to belong to the family of God where I don't have to live in the slime and the, and the muck of a sinful life? We've been freed from that. We've been delivered from those things. And we can now be His true image bearers, understanding the big picture. 
Now this brings us to the second and third questions of the sermon very quickly. Why is it important for the Christian to remain anchored to this big picture of the purpose of God and passion for that purpose of God? Well, for starters, it's for today. It's for right now. This, this very moment. How, how does it do that? You see, when you are mindful of the big picture of the purpose of God, what God is trying to do, His will, when you are mindful of that, and you are mindful of the, and have a passion for the purpose of God, for seeing that will done in your life and the lives of others, you will maintain right beliefs about things. It, it'll just happen. In today's world, I believe that's extremely important with what we find being presented in our culture today. And it, you remember what it says about this present world? What does it describe it as? Evil. Evil is being presented in abortion. Evil is being presented in transgenderism and homosexuality. Evil is being presented in greed and corruption and pride and sexual immorality. All those things that come about in this world. We need to maintain right beliefs. And the only way we're going to have right beliefs is if we are in tune and anchored to that big picture of God's purpose and have a passion for that purpose in our lives. When we anchor ourselves in God's big picture, you won't have to worry because you'll have a right understanding about marriage. That marriage is between a man and a woman. Just, it's done. God said it. That's how it is. I believe that. You'll have a right understanding about relationships. You, you won't have to worry about gender. you understand that God said, I created a male and female. You won't have to worry about those things because you are anchored in God's purpose in that big picture. You won't have to worry. You'll understand about government and family and education and every aspect of life because you have God's Word and you've seen the big picture. We will know the right because we have been put right with God through Jesus Christ. Now question three is, how will this anchoring affect my life? Well, if you maintain right belief, you will have right behavior. I have said this so many times, uh, I feel like I'm just supremely redundant, but belief always dictates behavior in anything you do, go to do. In other words, how you believe about things, that's your worldview, that will show in how you behave in that world. How you believe about the world is how you will behave in that world. And this is the great importance of knowing the big picture because what we know of God in the past and in the future with God, that determines how we should think and do now in the present today. What I know about God, God has made mankind, mankind fell. He has a purpose to save us through Jesus Christ. One day, and that came about, one day He's going to come again and save us from this, from this completely... Uh, messed up world is going to change new heavens new earth new Jerusalem coming down God's going to dwell with us what we know about those two things should determine how we behave today if I know there's a judgment coming it's going to make me do right today I want to I want to I want to be faithful to God this very moment today you know this isn't a a new teaching or information. This is real living with a renewed mind. When God renews the mind, uh, this is what it means to, to be a transformed person that's willing to renew and transform others. Help to do that. Be God's representative. Be God's image bearer in the world. This has been at work by the Spirit of God throughout His people through all the ages. It's the duty being done until he returns and finally and fully restores creation. When paradise was lost, one day paradise is going to be regained again. It's precisely because of this that the world has seen positive advancement and influence. Did you, have you ever realized what the world would be like if it hadn't been for Christ? If it hadn't been for him coming? You see, we've lived in a world now where we've seen all the advancements. We've lived through some of those things. But can you imagine a time if Christ had not come, what this world would be like? All the positive advancement and influence in the world, it's because of Christ working through big picture Christians 
that we have churches, church houses all across the land. It's because of big picture Christians and the Spirit of God in them that we have hospitals, orphanages, educational centers, goodwill stores, food pantries, on and on and on. It's because big picture Christians were showing the world who God is by bearing His image of goodness and righteousness because we've been delivered from the evil today, the present evil world. It's big picture Christians doing their little bit while in the present today. Now some of us can't be foreign missionaries. Some of us can't, can't go thousands of miles to a foreign country and, 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 and spread the gospel. We can't, you know, some of us are not preachers. Some of us are not teachers. Some of us are not, you know, all these other little titles and things that, that we can get down here. But I tell you what, we can do our little bit. God has placed you in a place and with people, and in and, and your circle of influence that you're around, the people that surround you, you can, make it, you can show the image of God to people. Big picture Christians doing their little bit while in the present today. In this world of darkness, will you be a light? In this world of hate, will you be loving? In this world of confused thinking, Will you be a mind of clarity? Sometimes I'm just in awe about when I see a news clip or read an article, I think, well, how dumb can people be? How crazy can they be to think that way? It's confused thinking, chaotic thinking, turmoil all in the world, but you, through the Spirit of God, can be a mind of clarity in this world today. In this world of greed, will you be a giver? In this present evil world of godlessness, will you be God's image bearer? Will you be a big picture Christian? I pray today that every one of us would take to heart the big picture God is trying to do with the purpose of God and what His intentions are through Christ. It's the only thing that can make a change in people. We can have kings and governments and presidents and all these things and Congress has changed hands a hundred times and the power that goes along with it, but they can never change the heart. It can only be through Jesus Christ. It can only be that image of God, that Spirit of God that has to be given that can make the change and that is done through the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we would live that way in the world, I think we could see more change in the world. But when you live that way, the Bible says, Yea, all that live godly will suffer persecution. So be prepared to pay the cost. I think that's one of the main things where people, they back up from service to God and say, You know what, I don't want to be talked about. I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want, to, I don't want things to happen to me. And I don't want people to be mad at me. And we're afraid of what man does instead of what God's purpose is. Let's have a passion for the purpose of God. Let's have a passion in our hearts to be image bearers of God each and every day in the present world we live in that we are delivered from, that we can show someone, maybe multiple people, that there's a better way to live. We can live God's way until that time He does return and He and us, we all dwell together with Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today, God, for your word. So thankful that you chose to come down to save us. Lord, I know we wasn't worth it. God, we've all sinned and, and fell short of your glory. Yet in your mercy and your grace and compassion, God, you, Lord, you, you chose to save us. And God, I believe it's because you wanted to dwell with us. You wanted to be with us because of how much you love, God, your creation. And Lord, I ask you today just to help us to remain faithful to you in this present evil world. Lord, it seems like this, the chaos and the turmoil is just uh, increasing so much each and every day that we live. And God, we're faced with so many different things now, different thoughts. But God, we know that that if we stick with you, 
We stick with your word. It's the one truth. It's the constant that we can, uh, Lord, rely upon. And God, help us to remain faithful to that purpose that you have. Help us to stir up a passion in our hearts for wanting to be your image bearer in the world. That we can show others that they don't have to be in bondage to this evil system that's here now. They don't have to be in the bondage of sin. But through your death and your resurrection, God, you can free, Lord, the souls that are there in the chains of sin. Lord, thank you so much for this time in your word. Thank you for allowing us to come before your throne of grace. Thank you, God, that it's not a throne of wrath, but a throne of grace that we can bow down and ask of you. God, I pray today that you would be a blessing to each and every one that is here. Be a blessing upon Springdale, God. Just raise them up in your power and in unity of your spirit and give them the things that they need. God, I pray again for Brother Rich and his recovery. Just strengthen him with might, uh, God, with wisdom and courage to remain faithful and can continue uh, to proclaim your word and shepherd this flock. And I pray and I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.